Welcome, everybody, to a special episode of the Police Applicant Podcast on YouTube. This uh, special section is called uh, Law Enforcement Officers Stories from the Inside, and it's a new section that we're doing on the YouTube channel, and this is our uh, premiere episode. So um, this is going to be broadcast. We'll we'll be discussing things like uh, leadership, betrayal, internal affairs, corruption, and lawsuits within police departments from the inside out. And a lot of times you hear in the news that police officers were corrupt or there's something going on, police officers were bad and things like that. But we never hear stories from the officers who were targeted by their departments. And so we're going to start this off with Amanda Carley, who uh, has a very interesting story. Amanda, welcome uh, to the episode. Thank you for having Uh, me. Yeah, you know, when I first heard bits and pieces of your story, I was intrigued because it is such a bizarre happening and you can't believe that this type of thing could even occur, but it can. And so um, today's episode, I think this is a really good way to kick off this portion of the channel because I, I've been thinking about stuff like this a lot of times, you know, where police officers and law enforcement personnel are targeted by their departments and they're mistreated and there's cover-ups and there's all kinds of corruption from the top down. And um, your story is so interesting. So let's get into that. First thing I want to do is I want to find out about you. How did you get into law enforcement? What's kind of your bio uh, and your background? Sure. Um, so in 2006, I had I was working as a volunteer crisis, uh, domestic violence, ironically enough, a domestic violence and sexual assault counselor. And then I had been introduced to the victim witness um, position at the DA's office, and it was very intriguing. So I decided to apply, got the job. Uh, I spent six years in the courtroom, essentially, working with victims of sexual assault. Um, it was a special grant. Um, so I loved it. And then I basically achieved the highest, you know, position that I could. And very, I was very intrigued with the law enforcement portion, uh, what went into building the case and actually getting to the point where it came to court. Now that I had a good understanding of court, I wanted to finish, you know, just exploring that side of law enforcement. Um, at the time I was dating, Uh, the guy that we're going to be talking about, he worked for the police department. And so I already worked for the county. So for me, it was just easier. I wouldn't have been able to work at the police department. Right. And we're talking a very small town. So the county was it for me. So I lateraled over and became super supervising officer of the PRCS sex offenders and mental health caseload. So that's all the local parolees, if you will, under AB 109. Um, that shift happened, I believe in 2011, I started probation 2012. So because I had worked with the sex offender caseload at the DA's office, it was natural for me to just slide right into the sex offender supervision. Plus nobody else wanted to do the caseload, right? Nobody wants to work with these offenders. And then they kind of tackled on top of the mental health, um, parolees. And that becomes more important later when we get to the part about, um, you know, the punishment and me, my ability to do my job without a firearm. You know, it was a very serious high risk caseload. So, but yeah, so I ended up there um, and then some things happened, which we're going to discuss. I ended up leaving, coming down. I was hired by the state of California as a criminal investigator for Orange County in 2019. And then um, I ended up hanging it up in 2020. Um Yeah, once I had achieved the goal and knew that I could do it, proved to myself that I was worthy of the job, right? And then it was no longer Mm -hmm. anything I wanted to do. So, um, yeah, so that's that's my road to here. So you kind of got out of law enforcement. Um, Did did this whole did this whole thing that happened to you? Did that kind of sour you on law enforcement on the law enforcement profession? Yeah. Absolutely. I, yeah, the betrayal and the mistrust and the, yeah, it, it ruined the entire profession for me. And 
um, my faith in the profession somewhat. Um, I think it was also very raw because, you know, the more time that passes, obviously it's going to feel less intense, but the entire event, what happened to me as a result of what my department did felt like it absolutely ruined my life. Um, so I've been able to kind of, my faith is a little bit restored, but it's just not something that I'm willing to work in anymore because you're not able to stand up for yourself. I'm not able to speak up. The person that I am today could not go through what I did back then and you know what I mean? And be very mm -hmm. diplomatic about it. So it's just not a field for me anymore. You know, I have a good friend, uh, Nick Wilson from the resiliency project in the Indian inland empire. And he, um, after 2020, he had told me about, he mentioned something to me and I had never heard of it before. And I've been around law enforcement for decades. And he told me about something called leadership betrayal. And it was one of the reasons that people were leaving law enforcement in droves because of the, of the betrayal by upper management and yeah. how they treated their, uh, their personnel. So we're going to get into that a little bit because that happened to you a lot, big yeah. time, big yeah. time. Um, so I want to know, and I'm going to, I haven't practiced this name. Noble, yeah. what's, what's the name? Uh, so you pronounce his last name, Widelick. Oh, Widelick. Some people, yeah, you know, yeah. Some people call it Widelick, Widelick, White, Wide, I don't know, Widelick. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'll call him Noble. Yeah. So what happened was you had met him and uh, in 2009? 2009. Mm -hmm. And you were working and, and he came to a, he was a detective and he came. How did that all come about that you met him and began a friendship and then began dating? I was working at the DA's office um, and he happened to have a child abuse case. He was working. It was um, some ongoing like sexual assault case and it was a lengthy case. So, of course, he would, you know, everybody would come to the victim witness office prior to any hearings or to prepare or to re-interview the victims. So he, you know, showed up one day and then started coming around and and then just never stopped coming around. So. Yeah, we had that connection. I worked, you know, helping the family, the victim, and he was the detective at the time. So he was a detective and you guys started a relationship and eventually uh, fast forwarding into the relationship, you ended up buying a house together. Uh, he was your fiance. And so that it was getting, it, it was obviously very serious um, by the time some of this stuff happened. So who exactly is Noble um, of the Ukiah Police Department? Um, he, so you just want a little bit about where he came from in his background or where he's at today. Who, who was he? Because, because mm -hmm. part of your story is that, um, part of your story is that even after a lot of this stuff was happening, he mm -hmm. still got promoted all the way yeah. to chief of police. So who was he connected? Who was he? Yeah. Yeah. So, so part of this, story is so bizarre because of the area we lived, right? So Mendocino County is a blip on the map that nobody knows about. It's there for wine tasting, the redwoods, and weed, right? Emerald Triangle. <laughs> so that's it. And it's the city itself was five square miles, just to give some context. The county itself was very large and rural, but Noble came from a little town just outside of Ukiah. This town's called Potter Valley. And I think the graduating class for them was like 15, very small. Noble was the, um, just from what I know from prior to meeting him, Noble was like the very nice kid and the the smart kid, or and he seemed to get along and um, with everybody. And he was like the golden boy of his little community, right? So as he rose up and then decided to join the police department, he is just really good at taking on that role and just being whoever he needs to be in the moment to please the people and to look really good. So he he had mastered the skill um, of being the golden boy, essentially. Um, but then, you know, like as we know, right, in human behavior and in law enforcement also, 
what happens then when you go home and hang it up is a totally different thing. So he was everybody's favorite in that department. And I would say, I mean, the, the, the man could do no wrong. So he was really good at, at what he did as far as the, you know, the mask and portraying, keeping a level head, um, just seeming so willing to do anything and everything to get the case done and sincere and, and just, he was a good ass kisser, to be honest. And so from the time you guys started dating to the time you escaped the nightmare, how many years had passed by? Um, all of that went down in 2015, actually April will be, yeah, 2015. How many years is that? I've, I used to keep track, six, but so six nine, years. no, wait, nine. So 2000, 2015 is when the, yeah, when the allegations occurred, I left in mid 2016. So eight years, okay. eight ish. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so this, and, and the reason that, that we're going through this is, is that I, I want to, I want to form a foundation uh, for the conversation. And so yeah. you started dating and he starts, um, he's the golden boy. Um, is it in Ukiah or is it just the area? Yeah. Ukiah is where, um, it, the police department was and, and then, um, yeah, but he was well known throughout the County, you know, all the agencies were really small, but Ukiah police department in itself was very well respected and the sheriff's department, you know, everybody has their, they have their reputations and the sh the deputies don't like the city cops and vice versa. And, you know, there's always like the contest to who's bigger and better and badder. But for me in my specific um, department, and this plays a big role in later events, is that the people in my department, most of them were apprised of people who had never been to an academy. I don't know if they didn't have the motivation or they tried and they were DQ'd, how they ended up there. Um, but they seem to envy the Ukiah police department, especially to put them on a pedestal. So when I came to the department and the fact that I was dating a Ukiah police department detective was a huge deal. And it sort of made me like kind of bridge the gap between the police department and probation. I think there was, you know, some machismo, you know, like we're bigger and better and badder than you. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the probation department felt like they now had a little bit more of a connection and an in with the police department. Um, so very much envied them and wanted to be liked by them. Um, and I happened to kind of bridge that gap because before they didn't work together, they didn't communicate, they didn't back each other up in the field. And then that seemed to change when I came along. So it seems to me that, um, you know, I always knew California was three different states. There was Southern California, Central California, Northern California. But in reading the yeah. articles about your case, it almost sounds like Northern California is kind of smallish and it's insulated and it's, they kind of do things their own way up there in Northern California. Very much so. Absolutely. It's a world of its own. And, um, it's, it's really bizarre and hard to explain. And if I try to tell my story, people will say the same thing you did in your intro. Just it's hard to believe these things happen in our world today, um, let alone, you know, you would think this was something that happened way back in the day. Um, and it happened right, you know, to me not very long ago. And it was very public. Um, everybody knows about it. And yeah, it still and, was allowed to happen, right? Yeah, and that's the thing, because where I come from in Southern California, everybody's known for, I mean, forever and ever, corruption in the higher yeah. ranks. It's its always been like that, but everybody kind of goes, ah, you know, they're going to get away with it. They always get away with it. Management covers for themselves. But if it got too hot, then people would start turning on each other, and then folks would get fired and, you know, police yeah. chiefs and things like that. But not so not so with this story. Yeah, um, it's harder to keep a lid on things when there's more people involved. 
you actually have a larger department where you have internal affairs divisions. And that's the thing is with these small departments is they make up their own rules. They have their own internal hearings and discretionary hearings, then they have nobody to answer to and they have no oversight. Um, because trust me, when we get to the point where what happened to me, I went to every single person, entity, agency, a government official that I could even remotely, if I could find their email, their phone number, I tried the grand jury, you know, all of the different um, disciplines in place to be the oversight of these things, you know, maybe hoping to bring some attention um, to what was happening and essentially do what a larger department, you raise enough a noise, right? It may get the attention mm -hmm. and then things will change and nothing, nobody not a person. I mean, the media wouldn't even talk to me. Um, it was very bizarre. So I was on an island of my own. So um, kind of what I'm getting is that uh, there were a lot of moving parts to this whole thing. And everywhere you turned, uh, doors were closed in your face, even yeah. with overwhelming uh, overwhelming evidence. And so yeah. as we get more into the story, we're talking about the Ukiah Police Department, the um, probation department, the DA's office, department heads, everybody's yes. almost like they were in lockstep with each other. Yeah, and, and very much the puppet master was the DA. Um, and he was kind of the center focus, kind of moving all the puppet strings. So, but yeah, everybody was involved. I mean, CPS, it, it's, it was very political, very well known. Yeah. Yeah. Even the schools got involved with yeah. your, uh, with your daughter. And yeah. So there's tons of people that, and, and it was, it was, it was one of those things where, um, where it was the worst kept secret and yet it continually get uh, swept under the rug. Right. And then come to find out later that it was no secret at all. Yes. But, but the fact that they, they were able to keep it secret, for the purposes of punishing me um, and for what they did. Yeah, it's, it's really bizarre. So what I think were the getting into the uh, getting a little more into it. And so here we have a, uh, a story uh, from the LA times that highlighted your, your story. And right. the title of this article is a California police officer was accused of domestic violence. He still rose to be chief. Yeah. Even with this story, it's the traction that it should have picked up from this LA Times story didn't exactly happen. So getting into this, tell us about how domestic violence from a police officer which we know happens. Um, how did that yeah. creep into your relationship? Because this guy wasn't, he wasn't um, somebody where you could just cover it up and stuff. This was, this guy was connected. He was high up in the department. And how did, um, how did the domestic violence get into the relationship and what kind of violence did you experience? Yeah. So that, that's an interesting question um, because obviously had I known he was capable of being so violent, I wouldn't have um, been together with him originally. But what happened was um, there, there came a time in our relationship where um, Noble was, he just was very needy overall. Right. So he always was wanting to be kind of how he was with his department, the, he wanted to be the star of every conversation, everything that was done. Um, he seemed to get, he was very jealous of my kids and my relationship. So I had two kids, um, not with him, obviously. And um, I, he had no kids of his own. And I was busy, you know, having, I had a career. And then being a full-time mom, going to school full-time. At some point around 2011, he... Um, he had, I had caught him, you know, talking to another girl essentially, and I was not having it. Um, I knew what, you know, something was going on. Um, I had kind of put my own little case together, uh, was able to prove it, confronted him. He denied it. At that point, he knew that I, um, you know, the cat was out of the bag. He wasn't going to be able to manipulate me into believing him. 
and I wanted out. Um, and that's when it started. So it was the, the little subtle things like standing in front of me, trying to keep me from leaving during an argument when I would say, hey, I'm going to go, right? Uh, things like that, blocking my way, standing in front of my car. And then it progressed just, you know, more intense, more intense to the physical. Um, right away, it was pretty physical. Um, so, and then it just progressively got worse to the point where then he wasn't able to keep a lid on it anymore. Um, most of the time it was happening, we would fight when he, like when the kids were with their dad and they weren't at home, right? So it kind of prolonged anybody knowing about it. But then I started having bruises on my face and things that I couldn't cover up and I wasn't necessarily interested in covering up. But um, there was a lot of dynamics. Um, we had went to therapy and I, in my mind, at the time had thought if I'm accountable and I'm being honest with the therapist, I'm telling somebody what's happening to me that I'm not going to like lose myself in this cycle because none of us, you know, intend to become that victim that I actually ultimately became. Um, I had had a pretty rough childhood and Noble was very, very keen on using, basically he triangulated myself and the therapist and convinced the therapist um, that it was my childhood issues that created dysfunction in the relationship. Therefore, I would initiate fights um, and then cause this conflict. And then with the stress of the jobs, right? And I actually, because this happens a little at a time and you don't see it, but day to day, this was kind of reinforced to me. Um, again, the therapist also favored him and said, you know, it's just really hard being the detective and seeing what he sees and, you know, coming home and trying to be a provider and, you know, just he fell for it too um, because Noble was that good. Mm. And um, so eventually the point of what I'm saying is that I became that victim that actually thought, well, maybe this is my fault. Maybe I am, I don't know how to love. I have daddy issues, you know, all the typical stuff. It was just manipulation now looking back, but I had a therapist who was actually um, suggesting that in front of him, which now I realize you don't do couples counseling in domestic violence situations. Um, that was bad. But anyways, um, that's kind of, so it progressed and it progressed. And then it got to the point where I, I was leaving. I had a plan. I had left for the weekend. Um, and then my brother, so I was out of town and my brother, I got a call that he had died. He had dropped a, uh, a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So my whole world fell apart. Um, obviously I had to come home and I was grieving and it was just the worst experience of my life. So I was in no position at that point, what I had going on personally and the abuse and everything. Um, looking back that, that, Obviously, dealing with my brother's death was my primary focus. But what that did was it allowed me to go back. It forced me to go back. And then he then was able to step into the role as this, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm so sorry. We're going to we're going to make this OK. And I love you. And he kind of stepped back into that honeymoon period. Right. It was the, taking advantage of the fact that I was weak and I was grieving once I was there once i had come back i had sort of lost the steam if that makes sense to leave so because i didn't just do it and continue it and came back i felt stuck and then after that i didn't feel like i had a way out and this is uh, noble in the middle there that is noble in the middle that one of his probably officer of the year awards yeah hmm um, so this, this thing with the, uh, with the, uh, domestic violence, I started pretty, pretty early on. Cause he was still a detective the first time it happened. Right. And then another thing that really created conflict was, um, when I then chose to get into law enforcement, right? So at the it, first I was at the DA's office, <coughs> excuse me. Um, when I then decided to make the move, now the dynamics were shifting, right? 
now I'm I'm doing I'm playing in his playground. I'm carrying a gun. I'm going to trainings. I'm getting opportunities to go to the Stabo, you know, the marijuana eradication school and getting certified and flying over the redwoods, hanging from a helicopter. And he didn't get to do that. Right. So I remember now looking back, there was this shift of power. He wasn't now the cool guy. Uh, he wasn't the only cool guy, right, in the house. And he that very much, very much made the violence um, turn up. So he, he was very jealous. Um, I remember when he found out I was going to do the marijuana eradication, he threw an absolute fit and basically convinced somebody at the department to invite him along one time so that he could try it out, right? So that looking back, that really um, probably was the was the pivotal moment when it became the most violent. And then as my confidence, you know, was growing because I'm going through the you know academy that we went through in our department, um, and you know, I'm carrying a gun. I'm learning defensive tactics and just having to be a different person than I was at the DA's office. I now was more assertive. I wasn't as easy to manipulate. Um, and so I started to kind of bite back and be like, you know, I don't need this. I don't need to deal with this. And uh, that really pissed him off. So. So he was getting pretty jealous of you actually uh, becoming more independent and uh, he wasn't able to gaslight you like he had. Yeah. And, to. you know, all he wanted to tell the cool stories and he wanted to be the guy that went into these dangerous situations and he wanted all of the limelight. And now all of a sudden I'm over here with my own stories. And then the other thing was my coworkers. He knew, you know, I worked in a male dominated uh, field, obviously, but my department also at the time, I think it was, there was one other person who was armed a female, but she didn't go in the field. There was two. So two besides me, one, one was a supervisor who never left her office and never carried her gun. So the point being is that I'm out here, right? So I'm going to task force trainings and operations with 12 guys from, you know, we were on this uh, multi-team um, Department of Justice task force. And so that was DHP, you know, different officers. And he was very much jealous of that. Um, so the typical, you know, fight would be, oh, you were talking to so-and-so or you didn't come home from the search warrant on time. Who were you with? I know you're sleeping with them. Just the classic, you know, jealousy, um, kind of just cloud of... Uh, yeah, he sure. just wasn't able to control you like he once could. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And he wasn't the star of the show anymore. For me, that was what really he wanted to be the star of every show, every conversation. He's the man that would sit down at the table and he wants everybody to sit, you know, sit, turn to him and wait for him to tell a story. <laughs> um, so I'm like, yeah, now I have stories and now guess what I get to do and and uh, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't okay with him. So, so, you know, so we can get this out of the way here. We have, here we have somebody in law enforcement, she's trained, um, she's armed and she's obviously you've, you've got what it takes to be a, a police officer. And yet people are going to go, oh man, you know what? you uh you were a cop how what what do you mean you just couldn't leave so let's get it let's get it out of the way yeah why you got into that domestic violence syndrome that so many of us have been on calls on and the the lady you could tell she's distraught blah 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 she's got kids um she doesn't work he works and yet she's all these things are happening yet she doesn't leave right yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's complicated because some of it is just from baggage. You know, we all have it from growing up and things that it, and experiences and self-esteem and um, things that m made me who I was on the inside, which 
clearly I needed, you know, a lot of work um, and a lot of growth to kind of overcome that stuff because I was very weak. I was very weak at the time, but um, it's a gradual process of becoming a victim to the point where you are convinced that you actually are not capable of doing these things. Yeah, I could tell somebody else how to live their life and advise them on how they were worth more, right? And worthy of a healthy relationship. But then when it came to myself, I didn't believe that um, because based just on my own personal circumstances. Um, but then it, it was a much bigger issue. So we owned a house together that was in the nicest community um, in that area. And financially, I was dependent on him. So he made three times the amount I did. We had this house I'd poured my entire life into. Um, it was my, it was just my dream house. Then the kids loved it. And all of our friends, so this all gradually happens, right? So all of my kids' friends, all of my friends were cops' wives and cops. And then we played basketball together and played softball. And the kids played on teams, right? And they're all in the same class. And so it becomes this kind of cocoon of a world that if you disrupt that, it's like the the hives, right? Like the beehive and swatting the beehive. Um, and I was very aware of what was going to happen if I left. He wasn't going to let me go quiet. If he was going to let me go at all. And then I knew how my department or how potentially people would view the situation, especially because I knew who Noble was behind closed doors. And I was very aware that that's not what people saw outside, right? Very different people. And so it was common sense. I knew he was the golden boy. He had always been the golden boy. That was not going to change. So me trying to leave a situation like that, it was very complicated. It was financial. It was emotional. And actually, my department doesn't realize and they don't care, but I very much was worried about what this whole unraveling of this relationship was going to do to my career. And I was so happy and I did such a good job and I loved my job. It was the only thing that actually really made me feel confident. And here I'm about to kind of, um, you know, swap the nest. And it just, it felt like a task that was, I was not able to, there was no way I was going to be able to leave. So now we have all this, all this evidence mounting over the years, right. people have you, you had friends of yours going, Hey, what's that bruise on your face? And yeah. he had, he had thrown you down. He head butted you. He threw you up against, was it a wall or he threw you up against something? several things. Yeah. Picked me up over his shoulders and threw me oh. down like a bag of like a, I remember feeling it was like a sack of potatoes. I don't know, like over his shoulder onto the ground, um, backed me up into walls, broke mirrors, like shoved me into mirrors, um, into refrigerators, uh, shelves, broke glass. Um, he loved to throw stuff and break it. Um, always seemed like it was around the holidays also, um, for whatever reason. But yeah, so I would tell people, I preserved everything that I could because I truly actually felt like I was not gonna get out of the relationship alive. So luckily, you know, now looking back, it was the smartest thing that I could have done was I had emailed pictures to my mom's email. Um, and I basically, I knew she never checked her email. She's old, you know, she never uses her email. I told her, hey, I'm gonna send some pictures. She knew what was going on a little bit, but even she, I couldn't disclose it to, right? Because then somebody was gonna step in and force this to happen and I wasn't ready. Um, so I had sent all of the photos, videos, everything to her email, um, not realizing that later that was going to play such a crucial role in my case and just actually standing up for myself and saying, Hey, I am a victim, uh, because nobody believed me. So the metadata, everything that I didn't even realize what I was doing, I was just sending them to her so that, Hey, if, if I end up dead, like make sure that these people look in your email. And then that's how I end up having these photos and recordings. And I would tell people I was stuck, but I wasn't stupid. I knew that it was not going to end peacefully. And if if I'm going to die, then somebody needs to know, right? Um, 
somebody needs to know what was happening to me. So, so we've got all the classic scenario for domestic violence that we've seen time and time again. Yeah. And we've got we've got power. We've got uh, uh, per, a person um, who's well liked and connected, and he's powerful in the community, and all these things. And he's just kind of doing these things, knowing full well, or believing full well that he's just untouchable. Absolutely, uh, that's a hundred percent the best description. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. He knew he was untouchable. And he was until he wasn't, but he absolutely was during my entire, um, you know, all the events that happened to me. He was and absolutely right. You know, it was a good prediction. You're to the point at this time where you could, he could have, he could have uh, punched you out and made you bleed and made you have all kinds of injuries and things like that. And at the end of it, you'd go, maybe I'm the problem. Absolutely. hundred percent. And, and like I said, I always want to reiterate that I had a therapist also reinforcing these things because the things that he was bringing up were pretty horrific and I get it, but why would you, the things that had happened to me, right? The experiences. So I think it was really easy to convince the therapist that I was dysfunctional, that I was antagonizing him, that I was creating these issues um, that I didn't know how to be in a healthy relationship, all the bullshit that you hear, which is just gaslighting. And I know now, mm -hmm. um, and even the therapist later admitted he had lost himself in this case. He had really wanted to like fix us and he himself even got lost in it. Um, yeah, he, he was so a victim of Noble's deceit as well. And I'm, I'm kind of getting that this, this Noble guy, the way he got the way he got to be where he was he seems like maybe he he was uh he was a charmer people just yes. thought oh he's just the most amazing he's just an amazing Ugh. human being so disgusting yeah people would be like oh he had this nickname for people in public would say oh that's noby or noby he was so perfect in everybody's eyes to the point where that actually, I knew that and that influenced part, you know, me leaving. It's not like just the guy next door. It's never the guy next door that everybody just knows any day they're going to wake up and end up on the news, right? It's always the guys or the girls or the people who you would never expect this from. And I'm like, I don't know how many, I, we were, okay, we're in 2024 now, back then 2015, 2016, uh, we know better as a society that what happens behind closed doors is not what you're going to see on the outside, right? We know in law enforcement that the statistics, the violence, the unhealthy relationships, the cheating, the drinking, the drug, the everything that happens as a whole, it just blows my mind looking back. I mean, people were going online and standing up for him, um, like berating me and belittling me and saying uh, to the point where during the trial or when we were getting ready to go to trial, there were people who were going online calling me Amber Heard, you know, because the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case mm -hmm. was going. And of course now they've retracted those statements, but, but it felt um, like he could never do any wrong. And then that so he also perpetuated the situation though. It allowed him to get he got away with so much and he was so liked that it just reinforced how untouchable he was which then gave him more confidence to do what he was doing to the point where people were seeing it hearing it witnessing it and he knew that and he still didn't stop in fact it got worse so, so was really he that was he that guy that people you could you could have you could have a video of him beating you up and they'll go I know him. I've known him for years. Yes. He would never do things like that. Thousand percent. And we have, you know, I have the recording where his voice is very, very distinct. And I have the recording where it's, you can hear me in the background. It's clearly my voice. My son's voice is there and he's there and he's hitting things and yelling and screaming and pounding his fist on the wall. 
And, you know, what people often would say is, well, why did you record him? Did you set him up? You must have set him up. So, and I I understand that people in general don't want to acknowledge this stuff happens. Nobody wants to actually face the reality of the fact that we have these kind of relationships, but also that they fell victim to his lies and his deceit. You know, they, everybody else still, there's still people who I guarantee you would back him up a thousand percent. And despite the photos, despite the case, despite him acknowledging wrongdoing, they would still, it'd be my fault. Or what did you do to do this to him? Or did you set him up? What benefit, right? Would I, what benefit did I have to be a victim of domestic violence and lose everything, go through what I went through and still be here talking about it today? Right. You just, it doesn't make any sense. And even so, um, your children were witness to the violence. Your daughter walked in on a bedroom scene. Your son walked in and still that wasn't good enough. No, my coworkers who, um, you know, saw him blew up and or blow up and uh, hit things and slam doors and get jealous. And they saw it and it was just like, oh, you know, he's having a bad day. It just, he literally could do no wrong. And the, the interesting, here's here's one of the interesting things. We're going to get into a little bit more of now what's what's going on as, the, as Katz gets out of the bag. So you're, the kind of a, uh, the interesting component to it is you're in the law enforcement community. There are people in the law enforcement community that are aware of this and they're mandatory reporters. Yeah. And so... Here we have this situation where there are there are people who are going, man, what's that bruise on your face? And they they know they know. So Absolutely. what happens now? A concerned Ukiah officer reports the abuse. What happened then? Well, and it's interesting because it wasn't even somebody concerned. Um, it was a supervisor of mine who was one of the guys that Noble was the most jealous of because he knew this guy would was. Oh, you know, he was trying to sleep with me. I don't know how else to say it, right? He was Mm -hmm. constantly, constantly trying. And Noble knew that. So when they, so it was a group of supervisors, some had just been promoted to sergeant. They all went away to a training together. So the police department, the sheriff's department, probation, maybe some parole, they were out at a training out of town and they had all went out for dinner and drinks. And per use for these guys is they drink way more than they can handle. And every day is a drunk fest, right? Especially trainings, right? That's when everybody let loose and go. So Jason Costa, um, he had been hearing from my coworkers, right? Because I I would show up to work. People knew, right? My bruises, I was upset. I was running late. I would make little comments. Like I just, you know, people knew. And I was being more expressive of it. He actually wasn't concerned I mean, I guess I can't say he wasn't concerned, but how he went about it was with little regard and no concern for my safety. So he just was drinking and amongst all of this group of men, of officers, he was like, hey, by the way, um, your your boy Noble is is abusing Amanda and you guys, you know, are basically just FYI, just kind of just joking, like bringing it up. Um, I mean, I wasn't there, obviously, so I don't know. Maybe he was concerned at some level, but the way he went about it, especially as a supervisor and domestic violence, right? You can ask a five-year-old child, and I feel like they could handle the situation probably better than Jason did. Um, so by just kind of throwing it out there to everybody in the group, the, the, everybody's newly promoted sergeant. So Freddie, who actually happened to be a really good friend of Nobles, right? Because they all work together and they're all best friends. So he actually did do the right thing. And he went back to his department and reported it and said, hey, we were at this training. There's these allegations that Amanda's being abused. So, you know, for what that's worth, I've always given him credit for that um, because that was something nobody else did, um, at least up until that point. Um, So it got, that's how it was reported. I don't believe from the bottom of my heart that there was any fear or motivation to help me, if that makes sense. I believe he was just drunk 
And it was like, hey, I can kind of throw out this tea on this guy and some gossip because he's the golden boy. Um, and Noble, you know, was not there to defend himself and it wouldn't have mattered either way, but, but Freddie did report it. And, and what rank is Noble at this time? At this current or when this happened? Yes. He was still a detective. Okay. So he's still a detective. And about what year is this? 2015. So oh, no, 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 I'm to... sorry. No, this first event, I'm sorry. This was in 2013. So 2013, it gets reported to Noble's department. Uh, was there an IA opened up? Was there a criminal investigation? So this is where uh, this is where all the bizarre events started to unfold. I was out at the range qualifying. I get a call on my cell phone from a supervisor, like the department mm, division manager, really high up, said, hey, there's somebody here in your office. We need you to come back. So I, you know, to be interrupted at range and to leave was a big deal. I assumed because I was not given any information that it was an investigator for one of the sex offenders or somebody on my caseload. So I left range in the middle of it, went back to the office. I was told this guy was in my office, walked in, shook his hand, introduced myself and sat down. And he introduced himself, said um, that he was there on behalf specifically on behalf of Ukiah Police Department, that there had been um, some allegations that I was being abused by Noble. He specifically said, this is not an IA investigation. I'm just basically here to triage. If there is anything going on, like fix it, like keep your shit quiet, right? It's starting to come out. He made it very clear that he was there for Noble and for the department's sake to ensure that there are no issues. And so, as you can imagine, I was completely blindsided. And in domestic violence situations like this, you know, my thoughts are, oh my God, now this is getting serious. People are realizing, what am I going to do? How am I going to go? Where am I, how am I going to feed my kids? You know, am I going to be able to afford to live? All of my coworkers, right? So this happened at my office. So when somebody's there interviewing me, my entire department knows it including Jason, who is the one who made those allegations, right? So in the moment, I looked at the guy and I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. I just, I denied it. I said, you know, clearly, right? This is me being the victim I was. Clearly, I know what to do. If I'm a victim of domestic violence, I know what to do. There's, you know, no worries. Have a great day. So that's what actually set off the chain of events for the future. Because what happened was... Um, there was no IA on Noble at all. Um, he came home that night uh, and was actually joking and was like making fun of Jason. Nobody believes him. Everybody thinks he's an idiot. He's a drunk. He was just, you know, like mocking him. And so what happened was Jason then um, kind of became the black sheep of the department because um, I denied the allegations. So in his mind, the Ukiah Police Department, who they adored and wanted the attention and the support from, now all of Ukiah Police Department is giving him the cold shoulder. And then he blames me for that. He blamed me for not, um, you know, confirming what was happening to me and not going along with the program. But I was not given a good option or a choice or a safe place to do it right could have been handled a million different ways um and so noble was i mean i remember it like it was yesterday he was laughing he was mocking jason because jason was a mess and everybody knew it and and so it it just became kind of a joke that this is who jason is and and so noble just further Kind of, he went along with it. You would think that if you were caught or almost caught, that you would stop. But instead, he became worse. Um, so he, yeah. So he kind of got emboldened a little bit. And and yeah. the Ukiah Police Department kind of pulls a mafia move and says, hey, nothing happened. You understand? And uh, they didn't even open an IA investigation, which on the most basic level, the most basic. For, I saw a cop. Um, he He jaywalked. Oh, yeah. IA investigation. 
this is a this is a mm -hmm. criminal allegation and the thing is you're not even the person who's a complainant yeah and that's what i thank you because that's what i said all along was i did not ask for this i did not go and report it um and ask for help and then all of a sudden recant and decide you know to walk backwards no and and there were so many ways that it could have been handled differently but one thing now looking back was had anybody ever pulled me aside given me two seconds to just wrap my head around who is this person in my office during work hours i'm on duty at my department like it should never have been conducted there it shouldn't have been the business of everybody they should have given me a heads up maybe i would have wanted to have my union rep there or somebody or just a quick conversation that hey by the way do you even know what an ia is because to be honest at the time i had no clue i knew at a surface level you know that's when somebody would get in trouble but it, i was convinced and it should be it's like conduct on duty that you know lying you know stealing drugs messing with evidence right you know falsifying a report that sort of thing um never in my wildest dreams would i have ever imagined so i feel like looking back so much could have been prevented with just a little bit of professionalism and a conversation to make sure that i knew and i mean i'm a, there's allegations of domestic violence is a very sensitive issue and i'm just thrown into the wolves and then because i didn't respond the way that jason costa had hoped i would i now became the target of his hate and the department in general because jason was kind of the golden boy of probation so the golden boys of these departments are the ones involved and um yeah it blows my mind so no ia for him he feels vindicated and actually feels like this is more of a reason to clown on Jason. And it just almost gave him more confidence to keep doing what he was doing because he didn't stop and it got worse. So just for clarification, the the person who, uh, how it got reported to Ukiah was through a, a probation department employee, Jason? Yeah, so he was the, the field supervisor for probation. So he was the supervisor of mine because I was on the field, you know, the I was always in the field, a field officer. So he was in charge of deciding who's armed, essentially, because in probation, the way that it works is the chief has the sole discretion of who's armed and who's not. The penal code allows that. So that's why some officers are not. Some people uh, go to court and write reports and they never go in the field and supervise, you know, offenders. Um, so Jason was the chief's right-hand man. So I'm being abused by the police department's right-hand man. And then I'm in this like weird triangle of, you know, uh, dysfunction and this whole event with the, with the golden child of the probation department. So now, Walk us through this part. So here we have the first the first public allegation that Jason somehow lets out of the bag. Yeah. And then there comes then some things in between maybe. And then all of a sudden, your probation IA gets involved. So walk us through to, to we, where we get to that point. So, so keeping in mind um, also what I didn't mention was because I had had the opportunity to see what Ukiah Police Department, how they handled that situation in 2013, it gave me an even better idea and just confirmed exactly what I knew was gonna happen was, you know, they were not gonna investigate him. They were not going to take the claim serious um, and they weren't gonna do anything about it. So keeping that in mind, these all these years later, the abuse is still happening. I know in the back of my mind that nobody will ever do anything to punish him. So the abuse got to the point where Noble was, you know, flipping out in front of other people. The incident happened with my daughter. Um, I don't even know, so much had happened. I don't even know what the specific argument or the events leading up to the headbutt, but basically she had walked in, I was screaming, he was holding me down on my bed. She walked in at the point that he had taken his big fat forehead and just, headbutted me right in the face, split open my lip. Um, she 
she later reports it to the school. So what happens mm -hmm. is, um, you know, we leave, but I'm like, oh, you know, I must have done something to um, make him upset and it's going to be OK and just mitigated and blame myself like a victim would do. And um, I didn't leave. So this kind of weighed heavy on her mind. She had a hard day, had went to the counselor. She had actually called me that morning and said, hey, I'm, I'm struggling today. Can I go to the counselor and talk to him? I like, absolutely, of course, 100 percent back you up on that. So what happened was the counselor did exactly what he should have done. Um, and he sensed something was going on more than what she was revealing. So he got it out of her and she said, you know, I'm afraid my mom's going to be killed. She doesn't know how to leave. Like the intelligence and like the wisdom she had at her age, unfortunately, she knew in the pit of her heart, right? Like she knew I wasn't going to leave and I didn't know how to. So she disclosed to him, which then set off the chain of events, the cross reporting to CPS and then CPS to the sheriff's department because we lived in the jurisdiction. Um, and mind you, um, I, so I was away actually out of town at a training when this whole report happened. So she called me crying and she's like, I'm so sorry. I, I can't believe I did this. And and that was it. You know, I was like, nope, don't be sorry. This. This is what it is. Um, so it forced me into dealing with this. Um, so I called CPS I, because I knew the ladies, there was two ladies there, the CPS, um, Child Productive Services. I actually initiated the phone call and said, hey, I realize this cross report has happened. I'm going to come down tonight. Um, we set this thing up. So I was proactive. Um, we met. By the time I had gotten there, they had already written up a safety plan meaning they had talked to her, they had talked to my mom, um, my ex-husband, who was also aware this stuff was happening. Um, and after talking to my daughter, they had determined that Noble was not allowed to be anywhere near my children. So in the safety plan, I just had to agree that, you know, to keep them separate and that they would not have anything to do with each other. Um, which of course, I did. I signed it. There was no issues. We never had any other involvement. Um, and um, that then set off the chain of events as far as me having to leave the house quickly. Um, my first interview with the sheriff's department, um, because the thing is, is I lived and owned the home also, but because they were my children and not his, um, what was the likelihood I was going to be able to keep him away from the house to ensure that he and the kids had no contact, right? And keeping in mind my daughter, um, Madison's the one who told. So she's in a special um, risk category in my mind, right? Because this is the guy that has everything to lose, you would think. And this, I think, was she 13 at the time? I think she was 13. The 13 year old just Kind of unveiled you know everything that he's about so i had the duty to i had to pick them up and leave i could only take what i could actually carry right so it was like a very fast vacating of the property because i couldn't ensure that he was going to stay away and if he had had access to the kids then i didn't want to risk losing them or even the the idea that i wasn't going to stay away and leave him so, um, yeah, so I then had, I think his, I think his buddies, um, came and grabbed him and had him go stay at the ex chief of police's house. Um, I think they knew that I needed a little time to get out of the house. So I had to find a place to live. Um, so I had no money. I, the only house that I could rent on such short notice was about 10 driveways down from the house that we owned on the same street. Um, it, it just got more bizarre and more bizarre. So I'm moving out. Um, and, you know, of course, my whole department and everybody's talking about it. Um, and then that's where then the the I mean, the interviews with the sheriff's department begin. So this is Madison, your daughter on the right. And uh, mm -hmm. she's about 13 at the time. Right. Um, so then because of her, you know, kind of saying, saying something at school, uh, 
the, you, what county sheriff's department opened an investigation? Uh, the Mendocino County Sheriff's Department, the same county that I worked for. Okay. So, yeah. so now we have the Mendocino County Sheriff's involved. You work for Mendocino County Probation. Right. And then there's also later on in this story, there's the Mendocino County DA's office. Yeah. And so, um, so at some point now that, um, now that uh, this is now an active investigation, somebody decides, hey, we, gotta, we better open an investigation on this. Yeah, because now, now they can keep it quiet because somebody outside of this police, you know, this shroud of secrecy reported it. And now you have to. And we have credible witnesses to the crime, uh, to the yep. crimes. Um, and so here we have a, a just a, an outstanding case with yeah. it's not a uh, it's not a one-on-one uh, -on -one. there are witnesses right. and not only are there witnesses but there's additional evidence from your other friends who saw the injuries i mean this is a good case this is super good and yeah, uh right you would think yeah you would think i mean the, how much more can you add to it and so now um at, at some point you your department your probation department calls you into the office right uh so what what they they did and basically what happened was when this report first came and was made i went to the sheriff's department and talked to andrew porter who um was the detective sergeant at the time um we were all friends also um we played on the same softball team together years and years in a row so this is the, the dynamics I was dealing with. So I'm going to him. He's kind of off the record before the interview going like, he says to me, the beginning of this interview, the first one of a domestic violence victim with the golden boy of Ukiah, he says, you know, I didn't want this case, but the sheriff is making me. Um, like I felt guilty because he was put in this position to interview me. Blows my mind that you would be so unprofessional but also to put that on somebody who had clearly been through so much. And he felt comfortable saying that to me. So I had already started out the interview feeling guilty for him, for everybody. Everything was my fault. This was happening because it was my fault. Um, and so what I did was I gave an abbreviated statement. I confirmed what Madison had seen and what she had reported. I said, yeah, it happened. I downplayed it. I I definitely downplayed it. She said, I think my mom was bleeding really bad after the headbutt. And I, I truly don't remember bleeding that time. But what nobody seemed to care of was there were so many incidents that I couldn't keep them straight. And she hadn't seen the majority of them. So I truly believed, um, you know, oh, it wasn't as bad as she said. But yes, it did happen. She's not lying. I need to go get my kids, get out of the house, like figure out my life. And when I'm safe, I'll come back because I felt compelled. I felt a duty to actually tell the truth, right? Because I'm thinking we're in a profession of ethics and, you know, abiding by the law and we're enforcing the law. And how can I arrest somebody and take them to jail for crimes such as what this guy was doing to me, right? If, if I was abusing somebody, I would expect somebody to arrest me. So I told him, um, I got to go get my kids, make sure they're safe, get out of the house. I'll come back. I'll provide you with every detail, pictures, statements, witnesses, um, recordings, everything. And he said, okay, walked me out. He's, he basically said off the record, like, I know you're not telling me everything and that's normal. When you're ready, come back. So that's what I did. And which investigator was this? Um, Andrew Porter. He was the only investigator to ever have touched this case. And that was with uh, the sheriff's department. Right. And okay. it was so awkward when I showed up. He all, you know, and I work with these guys every day, right? On these cases, we were in the field together, socially and professionally. He had made a comment, I remember, like, yeah, I had all the other guys leave so you could come down. So it was like their little detective office and they all knew I was coming. So he wanted to let me know that I, you know, I, I had them leave like to give you some privacy. I mean, God forbid. Um, 
Yeah. And um, there, it's, it's interesting because the things that these people uh, focused on, it just blows my mind. He had, I read this report and it just, it just makes me so angry. He makes a comment in the report that, you know, like something like Amanda was flippantly making comments about how this was not her first time in this chair, meaning he portrayed me as this kind of just, um, like I'm not taking this situation serious, that I had made this flippant comment about having been interviewed before for something. And what he doesn't know, and still to this day doesn't know, is that when I made that reference, it was actually something very traumatic that happened when I was a kid. That's what I was referring to. And I made the comment saying, I have been in the sheriff's department in this chair for a different reason. And he, I feel like from the get-go, this whole illustration, right? The reports were painted in a way that kind of made me out to be this, um, well, just, I mean, I was weak at the time and I was a victim, but like, I, I feel like he had a personal bias that for sure was, um, was apparent as anybody would read through the report. And something about that statement has just always really bothered me because I wasn't saying it as, oh, I'm a, I'm a um, habitual domestic violence victim and this is no big deal to me. Like, what do you want me to say today, right? This was, and had he been a good investigator, I would have certainly picked up on that and I would have asked some follow-up questions. If I knew the person in front of me had been through something traumatic or had a very traumatic childhood and had maybe experienced this before, I would have figured out what the outcome was. How did they, how did it get handled, right? A little sensitivity and kind of like know your audience. And, um, and he didn't. And so I think that would have been helpful for me had he recognized that or asked some questions to say, hey, this is something that is very traumatic, that it was very traumatic to go through that, especially with people I know, you know? And then knowing what's gonna come, that was, that was really heavy. To deal with, so, you know, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people that are that are damaged people. They're hurt, yeah, and they've been through stuff. And a lot of times, there are victims who go, "Well, I deserved it, so whatever," you know. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. You could have your right. personal opinion. Oh, the way she was, she was flippant or whatever, and she didn't give me the answers the way I thought. She she didn't show me the respect that I should have deserved. That doesn't mean yeah. it didn't happen because you didn't like the way someone responded. Exactly. And yeah, exactly. And we, yeah, we know all of that stuff affects who the person is in front of you is an accumulation of years of experiences that would lead them to what they're saying and doing right then and there. And the fact that he, he focused on that statement and enough that he put it in a report, it was of no value. And there's just always been something about that statement that it just really, really upsets me. Um, yeah. Had he been a halfway decent investigator, maybe he would have looked to see, you know, had I ever had any reports in the system? Had I, I don't know, I guess that's just me as an investigator. That's what I would have done. I would have figured out, have they ever had any run-ins with the law? Have they had any, you know, reports that they're mentioned in? Any prior domestic violence or child abuse allegations, victim or otherwise? And none of that was done. Well, a good, a good, a good investigator does not re-victimize the victim. And that's that's exactly was my point later when I realized exactly what had happened was you are re-victimizing somebody who's already had a really hard life, who's been victimized before. And while that is my own responsibility to figure out and to work through, I hadn't reached that point yet, you know. Some things take a really long time to overcome and events like this, um, you know, kind of knocked me out of the place I was at realizing, hey, if I don't start standing up for myself and dealing with these things and having a voice, nobody's going to do it for me. But before mm -hmm. this incident, I had no ability to do that for myself. So right. everything they did, it was, it was, I feel like it was 10 times worse because of having been through what I had. Um, 
And that's just that's just the truth. It's not for pity. It is what it is. We know that victims, especially childhood trauma, grow up to have more issues if they're unresolved or they don't get the right treatment or therapy or whatever the case may be. Standard domestic violence is like a, nobody ever asks, like, how did you actually get to the point where you believed that you couldn't leave? That would have been my first question sitting there in that chair off the record. Like, do you feel comfortable? Are you scared to go home? Nobody offered a protective order. Nobody offered a civil standby. I didn't ask for one, of course, because I'm humiliated and I'm ashamed. Nobody ever asked, like, are you, you going to walk out the door today and feel comfortable going home because he's at home and your children are going to be there? The, yeah. And by this time, I'm imagining you're you're feeling pretty defeated, um, even even with the uh, sheriff's department investigation. A criminal allegations are out there, and now you've got the the uh, sheriff's detective who's um, acting like you're not you're not acting right during the right. during the interview, and all, I feel like all of your worse nightmares are coming true about how you thought this would play out. Yeah, except for I had predicted it was going to be handled this bad, but I couldn't even predict it was going to be handled this bad. But yes, every every person, every department, every everybody that I encountered after that, it just got worse and worse to the point where I, you know, I tell the story and sometimes it's hard to believe what I'm even saying, that mm -hmm. I even experienced it. Yeah, it just was one thing after another. Um, so yeah, it was handled bad. Um, they never interviewed him. Um, so I have all the crime reports now, all 50 something pages of it. Um, and Andrew Porter uh, reached out to Noble and he text messaged him and he put this in the report. Uh, I reached out to Noble Weidlich, suspect of DV, whatever. Uh, by way of text message and essentially said this and he said you know something to the effect of there's been allegations i would i need you to come down and interview you um noble responded and said thank you very much for your text i would love to talk to you however my department has retained an attorney any further questions have to go through counsel yeah. that to this day was the extent of and I, that was the extent of any questioning he's ever had to go through prior from 2013 all the way through until today, as far as my case goes. Never once. So if this, if this is a personal allegation off duty, how does he get a department attorney? Well, and that's a, such a good point because that was an argument I made. I contacted my police union and, and my POBAR representative, right? So I paid for the representation of counsel. And they actually sent me a letter stating that it was not work related, that this was right. something in my personal life that I was not covered. So I don't know. And that that also then begs the question as to why my department then led and the DA, you know, took the steps they did in the future uh, when this was all off duty. Um, and also to be very clear, I make sure everybody understands that there was never, there's never been an allegation or even a comment. Uh, nobody has ever accused me of making up the domestic violence because right. when you hear about how I was treated, I would assume that would be as the perpetrator. If I was the one who had committed the acts of domestic violence, I would expect to have gone through what I did. So not only was there never an accusation in any of the court documents, the police report is very clear that I was the victim. There were many witnesses. People knew about it. The counselor knew about it. Um, my ex-husband knew about it, right? So there's no question of that. And then later, the you know the chief um, admits that everybody knew about it and still proceeded. So it was a very intentional act, uh, a series of events that happened, knowing that I didn't have representation outside of my union because it wasn't work related, but yet my department involved themselves. It, it's almost like one of those situations where 
where the detective gets a hold of of Noble and he goes, hey, just so you know, there's allegations that you were beating yeah. up Amanda. And Noble goes, yeah, yeah. So I'll just say that I got an attorney. And uh, hey, so are we still on for uh, golf tomorrow? Yeah, except actually his, he did get an attorney and a very good attorney, Justin Buffington, um, who was, there's a very well-known firm. I think they have a firm in Southern California as well. Um, and they actually called me and left a voicemail, which I still have, where he's like, hey, Amanda, my name's Justin. I'm representing Noble. Um, you know, there's been some allegations and we just want to come talk to you. We want to ensure that there are no issues for Noble at the department. <laughs> the voicemail that I have says that specifically. So here we are again. Everybody's protecting Noble. Want to make sure we look out for his best interest. We want to come interview you. What does that even mean? We want to make sure there's no issues. What? What? How do you translate that? Yeah. Um, we want to make sure that you're going to shut up. You're not going to talk and that this all goes away and that you're going to continue to be right. the good victim that you've been. And we want to make sure there's no issues for him because we know he's an abuser. Um, they actually came to my house. I met with them and I, I mean, I would love to get my hands on that recording, but I, I had these little moments of um, kind of enlightenment and I remember them because I was so proud of myself at the time for speaking up or for, for kind of coming out of my victim mentality. Um, and they were very significant. I remember saying, you know, if I were you, I would not record this because what happened to me happened. And, you know, for me, that felt like such a big moment to say, mm -hmm. don't record this because your client is guilty. Right. Um, so yeah, so they did their best to just, you know, convince me. I don't know. They were there to just triage and mitigate everything and encourage me to remain silent. Because yeah. I don't think at that point that I had actually gone back for the full um, disclosure in the second interview. So just when you think, this is pretty jacked up. This yeah. is the, some of the stupidest stuff I've, I mean, the people that are listening to this are going, oh, okay, so I know there's an ending to this story, but wait, there's more. Well, so there's just, so much more. <laughs> yeah. So all of a sudden, at some point, your internal affairs gets involved. So tell us how that happened. So, yeah, so we don't have, we didn't have an internal affairs division or anybody. Um, and actually what I was told later was that this was our department's like first real um, investigation of an employee on duty, um, which I wasn't on duty, but neither mm -hmm. here nor there. This was basically the department's first um, attempt of handling like an IA investigation to our knowledge. And so what happened was I had went back to the sheriff's department, had provided the photos, the picture, you know, pictures, videos, everything, gave full disclosures. Um, and then what happened was some weeks later, months went by. I thought everything was good. I had my gun. I was back to work. I mean, I was still on work. I, I actually hadn't been taken off work yet. And I, some random Friday, I get called in. Um, my chief and the division manager walk into my office and they're like, you know, you know, you're aware of the case. And I'm thinking, no shit. Um, my chief, <laughs> now mind you, he's never, he's never been in a uniform in his life. I, he may have graduated high school. He, very simple man, clearly had no idea what he was doing and he was not equipped to be chief and to handle the situation. He comes in, says, well, you know, the case. And he says, so um, I'm going to need to take your gun for the weekend. And I was like, why? And, I, and so I assumed he was taking my badge, my keys. He said, no. Um, he's like, I just need to keep it over the weekend and then we'll figure it out by Monday. So I gave him the gun, had my badge, my keys, went home. I went straight to my union rep, who was the smartest human I know. Um, and he is, he was like my saving grace just mentally, right. The whole time I went to Eisen's house and I was like, Hey, this just happened to me. What is going on? And I just knew, I just knew this was going to be bad. He advised me that they had violated my pole bar rights, that essentially they should have taken all of my stuff, put me on leave, given me a reason why, 
and then said, you know, this is what's what to expect. Instead, they took my gun, didn't put me on leave, had me show up that Monday morning. Um, and then I think, so basically I then had called the chief and said, you know, you violated our POBAR rights. You've now rung a bell that you cannot unring. Like mm -hmm. you were screwed. So what set forth in motion was the chief's attempts to just basically try to shove me out of the department, make me go away, you know, be quiet like the good victim you are and just shush, shush, and this will all go away. So uh, Monday morning I come in and I'm basically told I wasn't given a notice of intent to discipline or any written um, documentation telling me what they were doing. They just said, we're taking your keys, your badge, and you know, told me the process. I have to stay at home basically like I'm on house arrest Monday through Friday. I have to call in anytime I want to leave the house and take vacation, like to pick up the kids, you know, that kind of thing. So I was in timeout. Um, and it I was completely in the blind. I was like, why? What did I do? And I knew that nobody had ever accused me of doing anything wrong, right? Criminal wise, right? Because I had never, and that was embarrassing. It was embarrassing mm -hmm. enough. They just said, well, I don't know. We got to figure this out um, later. I get served with a notice of intent to discipline um, and this whole, you know, shit show began. Um, you want me to keep just talking about what happened next? I just to clarify, just to clarify, prior to this point, you get not from not from probation, but from other agencies you get called in regarding the information that's gone out and you being a domestic violence victim who's been gaslighted for years say no everything's fine i just want to i just want to get that out there so this is where we're at now and then all of a sudden your department gets involved right so let, let's move part yeah so then um so I'm put on leave. I don't know why my department is um, not telling me anything. Um, they they do they serve me with. Let's see. The notice of intent was not until later. So I think the first step was um, they hired an outside investigator. I think it was Kurt and associate, you know, some PI to come in. Um, and he was to interview me and the full like Miranda, he Mirandized me. He advised me that if I, you know, committed any crimes, yada, yada. Um, I remember at the time, my attorney, my union appointed attorney, um, he and I knew each other very well. We worked at the DA's office together and he had been fired by the DA, the one that was involved in this case. So he was a good attorney, but he was scared of the, the DA. And he was not um, he was not aggressive, and he basically just kind of went through the motions to um, represent me. So I remember saying, "I don't need my attorney there. My union rep was there. I went through a three hour long interrogation. Um, at the end of that, the I, there was a report written up, I guess, um, sent to my department. I was cleared of any criminal wrongdoing. Um, there were a few questions that were a little tricky that I think were completely taken out of context. For instance, um, do you feel you have an obligation to be honest in your profession? I'm like, well, of course. And mm -hmm. I have a duty to be honest about what happened to me as a victim. But at the same token, I was a victim and we know how victims are. And um of course, I wanted to be honest. I would have loved to have been able to be strong enough to say the first time, 2013, disclose it all, leave, go off right into the sunset, have a great career. It just wasn't something I was able to do. So I believe that the department took that and twisted it. So all they could come up with was um, at the conclusion of that, they could come up with the conduct and becoming. So basically the result of that report was that, yeah, she confirmed these things. She clearly is the victim. There was no criminal wrongdoing, but that, yeah, she admitted that she did not disclose all of the abuse. She denied in 2013, which mind you, just as a reminder, it was not an IA and there was no official report or investigation. So I could have told him to kick rocks and it shouldn't have mattered. But either way, I 
I denied it in 2013. And then during the first interview with the detective, which another reminder is I didn't have to go through that. I was not obligated as a victim to give any kind of a statement at that time, right? Let alone a partial or a full statement. But I did because I wanted my daughter to know she had done something that was really brave and she was getting a lot of shit for it. And as a mother, I was embarrassed and I was, um, I was so upset at myself for ever putting her in that situation, but I hadn't quite, you know, I hadn't quite reached the point where I realized how bad of a situation she had been put in to have to disclose this. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I went down there because I felt like this was the right thing to do, right? Are we not law enforcement officers that take an oath? We're supposed to tell the truth. The truth is supposed to matter. And so I give a partial statement. So then I go back and give the full account, you know, a couple weeks, couple months later, um, which is also not something I had to do. I was under no obligation, but it was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. How am I going to take somebody to jail for beating another person? And yet I'm over here saying, well, I'm not willing to tell the truth about what happened to me. This guy should be held accountable just like all the people that he's arresting. So after the interrogation the report goes back to the department, it clears me. And then all of a sudden the second shit show begins. My department then serves me with a notice of intent to discipline me. And the basis was conduct and becoming, which we know is that kind of catch all, mm-hmm. you know, a uh, policy that nobody in the department knows about. And it's kind of that, that catch all for when you don't have anything good. But remember the chief had violated my POBAR rights and and he could not go back and unring that bell. So what I'm told is that he just, he basically dug his heels in the sand and was like, I have to like basically push her out or we could be sued. And I remember offering to say, I'm not gonna sue. Will you please just give me my life back? Give me my gun. Let me go back to work. The one thing that I'm good at, one thing I love, I even offered to sign something saying I wouldn't sue because I just wanted my life back. You know, I'd been through so much. Um, instead, what they did was they offered, so they called my attorney. They were they said, we're gonna offer, you know, we're gonna like a plea bargain kind of deal, right? We're gonna offer her three days unpaid on the beach, a written reprimand, and I, I don't know, something else. And I remember my attorney at the time actually encouraged me to take that. And he said, mm. you're not, you know, it's going to be out of your personnel file in a year. It's not like it's going to affect your career because nobody would have ever imagined me leaving the department or the area. So, you know what I mean? So he encouraged it. And I remember at that moment, it was another one of those pivotal moments. I was like, no, no. I told my attorney, I was no, 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 no. So I reached out to a couple people, um, some outside counsel that I knew from the years of just being at the DA's office. Um, one was an employment attorney. She had said, you need to demand a Skelly hearing. You need to take this all the way. This is complete corruption. So that's what I did. Um, my department had made this offer. They thought it was a good deal, probably thought I was going to take it. Instead, I called their bluff. And this was that moment for me where I just like my awakening, right? Um, I was like, nope, um, I want a Skelly hearing. And per this, um, mm. per this policy, I can have my Skelly hearing public. So I want it public. I want it on this date. I'm going to subpoena the DA, my chief, everybody, Noble. We're going to, you guys want to do this to me? Let's go. And um, I was so passionate about it because my daughter had done this for me, right? I couldn't do it for myself. I couldn't get myself out of it. But the second that anybody put her in the position or me kind of even just um, like the, the shadow of a doubt had been casted on her because everybody thought she had made it up. Why wasn't he arrested? Why wasn't he prosecuted? So that's what really gave me the strength to stand up. And so I requested the Skelly hearing. We put it in writing over the weekend. Uh, we were supposed to go to the Skelly hearing on Monday and on Sunday, they called my attorney and they said, you know, after further consideration, we decided to 
just pull all attempts. Um, and I think that there have been other offers, like we'll take the unpaid, we won't take any days away from her, but the written reprimand. And I'm like, you know, somebody who has lost everything and has been through months and months of hell, right? I lost everything. Um, you're going to try to take three days unpaid. What what benefit would the department have received by taking three days unpaid from a victim who had lost everything? A single mom of two kids who clearly is a victim, right? Mm. And so, so they, that weekend, they um, I called their bluff. They pulled the attempt to uh, punish me and rescinded all of it. So were the allegations that you had initially lied during your first questionings about the domestic violence? Yeah. So the conduct I'm becoming was the basis was that I had given inconsistent statements regarding my abuse. So again, this is the part for me that is perplexing. So they're saying we're going to punish you for not fully disclosing the abuse the first time. So they they made it, they painted me out to be this liar because in 2013 I denied it. And then when my daughter reports it and it comes out, I give a partial statement. I never made anything up. I never accused him of doing anything that was not actually true. It was that they wanted me to disclose it all the first time, which I'm under no obligation to do. Um, and that then the then I went back and gave another statement. So it made the first statement inconsistent. It doesn't even make sense. But what 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 is amazing to me, and I think like the biggest takeaway from this situation is that by punishing me for not fully disclosing the abuse, that means that everybody involved is acknowledging that they know the abuse happened. So in, right? so in order to punish me and say, you know what, you should have disclosed it all the first time, they're admitting that they know I was a victim and I had been abused by this man. I just didn't disclose it the way they would have preferred me to. Or maybe, uh, you know, I don't know why. It, it really had nothing to do with that. It was just all they could come up with, I guess. And so that means the DA, my department, the sheriff's department, everybody involved is essentially saying, we know he did it, but you just didn't tell us all at one time. Which, mind you, I could have saved myself all of this, all of this heartache had I been that mom that had went in and said, you know what, we're out, we're leaving, I'm not giving a statement, or maybe stayed with a guy, right? We know how many times that happens. Mm -hmm. And the kids just kind of get pushed aside. Nobody listens. Nobody cares that the kids have experienced this stuff. I could have just stayed. Or I could have just kept my mouth shut, not given any statement. They couldn't have um, compelled me to. And I would not have had my career completely ruined and my life um, completely turned upside down. But then what would that message have been sent to my daughter, right? Mm -hmm. And to my son who I'm raising to say, you know, we're, we're supposed to be honest people. We're supposed to do the right thing, you know? Um, and so it's so ironic to me that nobody else has seemed to really um, hone in on the fact that they're admitting I was a victim and he was never prosecuted. So any, any police agency or investigator that's been around the block a couple times knows that this is an untouchable situation, that it's a hot potato, that you're not yeah. gonna go, hey, so let's, let's open an IA on Amanda. I mean, so it begs the question, <laughs> it begs the question, what was the, what was the point? What was the point of opening an IA on you alleging that, well, you didn't tell, you weren't fully forthcoming as a victim of domestic violence? So, and that's the part that it's amazing. <clears throat> so the department, <clears throat> sorry. The department hated me because Jason Costa was the right-hand man when I did not substantiate the claims of abuse in 2013, he then looked like a douchebag, right? The police department began mocking him. And then that kind of spilled over onto the probation department. Like, oh, those guys, the wannabe cops, the this, the that. 
Jason hated me so much for ruining his reputation with Ukiah Police Department. He admitted that later. And he ended up having a meltdown. And this is why I know this was not based on the department trying to make sure that I had rectified this situation or that I was never going to continue to be a victim. Right. He had had a meltdown one day. We were all out at the range. This was before my gun was taken. He had found out that I had not disclosed the abuse and he had a complete meltdown in front of all of my coworkers. He was, he was like, Amanda is a cunt. I can't believe she lied. Now she, you know, he basically told his um, state of mind. And he said that he couldn't believe that I had made him look like a liar. But my argument to that is I'm so sorry you were worried about yourself when I'm in a situation where I felt like my life was in danger. And the way that he handled it, and that was not by my choice, the fact that he went and was drinking, and spewed something that could have literally ended my life. Noble knew about the report to Ukiah Police Department before we did. So putting me in that position, you know, I don't feel bad for Jason. He was so embarrassed because of how it made him look. It had nothing to do with me and what I was going through. And had he been a solid individual, he would have said, look, I understand she's a victim. This is what victims do. Victims do not leave the first time most of the time. And if so, it's because they're forced or because they have no other choice or maybe because they have support. Had, had my department supported me, had anybody, one person along the way supported me, maybe I would have left sooner, right? But instead, I became just the gossip central of the department. Everybody knew what was going on and they hated me. They hated me. And so this was the only thing they could do. They hated me. They wanted me gone and they wanted me to pay for what I had done. And um, that was the only way they could do it was trying to write me up and trying to punish me. But then so, what happened after that was, oh, and I should say when I was off on my IA leave, right, it was about eight weeks, Noble um, got promoted to sergeant. So a friend calls me. She's like, hey, have you seen on Facebook? Uh, he was like being resworn in as his new position as a sergeant. So I am off on an IA investigation for being a victim of his abuse. And he's being sworn in, taking another oath, which he does not intend to uphold. I'm sitting over here with my life in the balance going, I don't even know why I'm off of work. What did I do wrong? It blows my mind. So he doesn't have an IA. Never. He never do. had an IA, not a single one. And, and nobody um, was going to force him to. <laughs> nobody nobody cared. And you, um, so in the meantime, they take your gun, they take mm -hmm. your cases, um, and they wanted you to work your your cases that normally you, you would be carrying a gun. They want you to work that unarmed. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. threaten you during the initial opening of the interviews with a criminal complaint. Um and they turned on you. Yep. And so you're at home for eight weeks wondering what universe is this? Yes. And what can I do and who can help me? And the answer was nobody. Nobody could help you. So yeah. um, tell us about the, uh, the DA's involvement in this. So what's interesting is, so after all that, basically they call me say, okay, you've been cleared, you need to come back to work, but we're not giving you your gun back. And that's when I started pushing back and I'm like, why? The department policy is if you are in this position, you must be armed. It's a mandatory armed position because of the danger, right? Sex offenders and mental health, like schizophrenics that are the, the worst of the worst. I'm supervising in their homes, in the field, taking him to jail. And so I'm like, wait, what? So come to find out the DA's office, that's how they got involved. So the DA, um, just a little history on him. He was the defense attorney for a long time for a private, um, like two or three attorney firm in town. He had, he had a reputation of being a bully. And I guess because he presents strong, people were scared of him. You know, and this town, obviously, there's this whole theme here, right? People just... Um, 
they just kind of follow the people that they put on a pedestal and they respected this man. Uh, I don't know why, but basically he was a defense attorney for a guy who had, so I was the victim of a first degree burg. I shouldn't even say victim, but a guy was caught in my house, burging my house and DA Eister or David Eister was this guy's private attorney back in the day. Right. So I think this was around 2009. So this guy uh, hired Eister. He represented him. I think it cost like 28 grand. He was charged with stalking, a bunch of stuff. Anyways, he's that kind of attorney that when he represents somebody, um, whoever the victim is, is like dead. Right. He's that guy, like that angry man who is, you know, can't get married, have kids, just very angry in his life. So he represents his people like they're, you know, the chosen one. So the DA hated me, hated me for actually going along with prosecution. I was like, I worked at the DA's office. It was very embarrassing, but you burked my house, dude. And so they pled it down. He got sentenced. Later, the, he became the DA and I was still working at the DA's office. So that's why this is also convoluted. So all of a sudden the election comes, he gets elected, he's put in as DA, I'm working in his victim witness unit and he hates me. So I went down a couple months after he was in office and had a conversation with him. And I said, look, I know you don't like me. The feeling's probably mutual, but I just need to know, essentially, I just wanted to kind of get the awkwardness out of the way and say, am I gonna have issues here? because it was very apparent how he felt about me. And um, he was like, no, I've been told you're a good employee. And as long as you don't give me any issues, you know, some BS machismo statement. And I was like, okay, we're fine. But I knew he hated me. He was going to never like me. So when this whole thing came up, and now mind you, Noble is the golden boy. He also was a detective that had worked on some really serious cases throughout the year or uh, the years. So I feel like there was a combination of trying to preserve um, these allegations from coming out because I think, and I don't know if you would know, um, would some of the people he put away and you know went off to prison, would they have an appeal issue? Would they be able to appeal based on criminal conduct of this officer while they were, I mean, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I think that there was multiple things going on, but also the DA just absolutely hated me, coupled with the fact that the penal code allows the chief to decide who's armed. So when you get my chief in the department who hates me, you have a DA who hates me, you are trying to protect the police officer's conduct from coming to light, which then could set off a whole chain of events. Um, what they basically did was just kind of ganged up together and their efforts were, you know, pointed towards trying to push me out of the department. And if I went away, then all the issues would go away. So the DA refused to prosecute him. And where his involvement became more was, this was months and months and months later. And I was put through so much that I was very angry. And I was like, you know, I'm a victim and I deserve to know what is he going to be prosecuted? I want to know what's going on. So I started aggressively calling the office and saying, hey, I want to know what's going on with this case. Are you guys going to prosecute him? Um, and then it became very apparent that they were not happy about that, that I was not going away and that I actually was going to speak up and demand something be done. Um, I also went to the grand jury. I had filed a formal complaint and named them all, gave them all the documents that pissed him off. Um, but I tried. I'm like, somebody has got to think this is bizarre and somebody has to like <laughs> recognize what's happening to me. So this um, this was 2000, maybe late 15, early 2016. So the DA refuses to tell me what the status of the case is. Um, they say, oh, you know, it's under investigation. Instead, um, they send a detective over to my office and he serves me with a notice of intent to place me on a Brady list. And the notice of intent says that I have a right to an appeal and to see the evidence and the accusations made against me that the DA felt was appropriate to try to put me on this list. First of all, I had no idea what a Brady list was. 
Second of all, I had no idea once I learned what it was, how that applied to me when all of this happened off duty. None of it. And I had went through at this point, six, seven, eight months worth of daily like meetings with county council and with my department. And I had offered to go see a psychologist. Are you guys worried that I'm going to like take my gun and use it against him or on myself? I mean, I exhausted all resources to try to get my life back. And when I started to push back, that's when he threatened me. So what the department basically did was they said that the DA orchestrated, the DA is the one who basically what I'm told now is that the DA called my chief down at the time, um, Buck Ganter, that's his name. He called Buck down to the office and said, you know, I'm gonna place her on a Brady list. That means that she's not believable. Um, I think they believe that I was not worthy of testifying, which is not true. It just, it's only a Brady issue if the DA's office or the public defender or anybody involved in the case don't know about the conduct, which still to this day, I don't know what the conduct was, right? It, it wasn't, it wasn't an appropriate placement or in, threatened to put me on the list. So um, but that was what they basically putting me on the list justified the chief not giving me my firearm back for some reason, or that's what they say, and then justified the attempts to punish me. And then also, um, was my, basically it was my scarlet letter. So we've done everything under our power to push her away. And I'm sure that they expected me to be weak because I had been for so long and they never expected me to fight back. And so once I did, they were like, well, we're not giving you your firearm back and we don't have to tell you why. They did not have to tell me. They just said it's up to the chief and his discretion. So they ordered me back and wouldn't give me my gun. So that was the most humiliating, devastating. Um, I mean, out of all the years of abuse and the things I went through in my entire life, that was worse by a hundred times because not only did the people that I supervised, you know, they notice, right. They're watching. They know I don't have a gun. Some of them were asking me why, like, Hey, Carly, where's your gun? Uh, my coworkers, all of a sudden I was treated like I was like, um, kind of the redheaded stepchild, if you will. I, you know, it was like people needed to protect me if I win, um, you know, I shouldn't have had to transport in custody to the jail. So it was like, well, we need to babysit Amanda because she doesn't have her gun. Or, well, if she goes on a search warrant, because I wanted to still work and do everything that I was doing before and get my life back. So I showed up every day without my gun on my hip, mortified, I was humiliated, the war that was the lowest point of my entire life. And um, I showed up every day and did my job. Um, and that was like, this was my own people. You know, this was like the people that I trained with. Um, this is the people that we knew we had accepted the fact that if we're in the field, and somebody shoots at us that we're going to shoot back to protect our people, right? Like this is a small family. I had been there four and a half years. You know, our kids were friends. We went to baby showers. You know what I mean? Like you couldn't get closer. And these were the people who were doing this to me all because maybe pride. I, I still don't really know. Um, and um, they just really hoped that I was going to leave. And so what really bothers me is that I was good enough to do the job and I was, they, they didn't say that I wasn't honest, therefore you can't supervise these people. You, hey, you can still arrest them. You can still go search their house. You can still go um, out and do search warrants, but we're gonna take your ability away to protect yourself and go home safe at night. So the purpose of not giving me my firearm was to punish me and humiliate me, which they did. And I stuck it out as long as I could. I think I showed up every single day for, I think I made it maybe eight months. 
And um, just out of principle, just to say, you know what, um, I'm not going away. And what you did is not going to break me, even though it was right. It was so embarrassing. But what happened was I ended up just getting to the point where my daughter was starting to not go to school. She had kind of fallen into a deep depression because um, nobody believed her. Everybody at school, her friends, the cops, kids that we we're all friends with, played basketball together. They were, you know, treating her as if she had made up these allegations because everybody was like common sense. If a crime was committed, you get arrested and you go to jail and you get prosecuted. You, um, how come he is not off of work, but your mom is? And how come she doesn't have a gun and he's just being promoted and promoted? So she had taken on the weight of all of this on her shoulders. And then she was also witnessing what this was doing to me. And she felt guilty. She felt like, had I just not said anything, this wouldn't have happened. So I knew we needed to get out of that town, you know? And so that's how I ended up um, ultimately leaving was because of her mental well-being. You know, my son was going into the Marine Corps and um, I just knew that any other place on the planet was going to be better than there, if that makes sense. So when, when did you finally decide to leave the probation department? So I gave my notice, um, I think it was early July of 2016. And even then, after everything I went through, if you could believe it, I remember telling the chief that I wanted to give them enough notice that they could find somebody good for my caseload. So uh, my chief, Buck, who had been involved the entire time, he um, was fired or he was allowed to resign in lieu of termination and right off into the sunset um, because of what had happened. Mm. Um, he had to go. And so he had just handled it so poorly. So they had brought in a female chief and one of the judges who was a good friend of mine had been advising me kind of off, off the record this entire time. She said, look, you know, cause the judges are the ones who hire the chief probation officers. She said, we've hired a female. We're hoping she's going to come in and kind of fix things and make things right with you. Meaning she's going to restore you back to where you were and you're going to be able to go on with your life because we all know the judge herself was talking about how wrong it was of the DA to do what he did and that it was very clear the corruption and that I in no way, shape or form should stop fighting for justice. Right. So this is how deep the corruption goes. Mm -hmm. She's sitting on the bench of the superior court with this DA and, and even she knows, and she's able to give me this advice, you know? Um, so the female comes in, I give her a couple months. No, it was a couple weeks. And I, I called a meeting with her and I said, Hey, you know, I'm sure you've heard about my circumstances. Are you going to give me my gun back? Because in my mind, I needed to make some decisions. And she did the same thing. She's like, no, you know, I've been advised. I, I spoke with DA Iser, and um, it's up to my discretion and I choose not to. And when I asked why, she said, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't know, she said obliged to tell you, or basically it's for reasons that I don't need to disclose to you. So um, I looked at her and I, I had already actually written up my, um, my notice. I just needed to date it. And I looked at her and I'll never forget. I said, I, I looked her dead in the eyes and I said, you know what, here's my notice. She says, I'm not going to take it from you. I know you're just upset. You're being emotional. You know, you're being a female. And I looked at her dead in the eyes and was so sure. I said, I would rather prostitute my body the rest of my life than I would work another minute for this department or this for you or anybody. She's like, oh, you don't mean that you, and I repeated it. And I looked her dead in the eye. I'm like, this is the most sure thing I've ever been in my entire life. What you've done to me and my family and my career. Um, I, so that's what I did. I gave my notice. I cashed out my retirement, which is 10 years worth of, um, 10 years worth of retirement. And I had a good formula. It was three, 3% of 50. I think that was the last year they offered that. I cashed it out because I had nothing and my daughter and I packed up. My son went to the Marine Corps and we moved down to Southern California. Um, I had no job. I had no money. Had no, we had no idea where we were going to go, but it didn't matter. Um, 
And so I think I'd given like a three week notice at the end of it. I, they had thrown me a party. And I remember the chief had written in this, this card for me, like, you're so brave. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what is happening right now? I have these cards that everybody's like, we're so sorry, everything you've been through. You're so brave. Just know that, you know, your future is going to be bright and blah, 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 blah. And I'm, I'm sitting here looking at it thinking, are you guys not the ones that just have ruined my entire life? Right. Mm -hmm. It was the most mm -hmm. bizarre set of events to just kind of top off everything that had happened. So, so we were secretly on your team the whole time. Just so you know, wink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which was not true because she could have restored. She could have restored everything for me and made it better. And I could have just moved on with my life, which is all I wanted. And truth be told, I've said this all along. This is not about I didn't want to be a victim. I didn't report my own abuse ever. And that's embarrassing. But I didn't ask for this. I wasn't seeking attention. I wasn't trying to get preferential treatment. I didn't want pity. I didn't want people to know. I didn't want to be in that situation, right? But but I wasn't given a choice and I did my best to navigate through. And um, yeah, it's just absolutely mind blowing. So during this time, explain, explain this to me. <laughs> How does he so all these allegations come out, and I'm going to guess that the city council from Ukiah is knowledgeable about all this stuff. Yes, absolutely. And how does he, so he's, the last time we talked about him, he was, he's a sergeant. So He was a sergeant. Mm -hmm. So then he must have gone, I don't know what the ranks are, but then there's lieutenant, there's captain, maybe commanders. He went to chief. every single, yep. He went to then lieutenant, captain, chief. Because, and he got, he got, what, what was the officer of the year three times or something? Yeah, I think I remember two specific times, but he was always just getting like the VFW award or the, you know, the good Samaritan, we love you kind of you know, praise. It just was disgusting. But yeah, all through this entire time that never stopped. So he kept rising the ranks and I'm, I'm just like the whole time going, how, how is this happening? I, I'm a victim of domestic violence. Um, and I remember it, County Council actually had told me that, um, unfortunately, Amanda, and this was in front of my council, she said, um, you know, women are still blamed for these things. And she also told me that if I sued down the road, that I would never be able to find a job again. So that's just the mentality of the people that I surrounded myself with from the county to the city, to the departments, to um, that essentially the entire town. The, the reporters were on um, staff, they were being paid by the DA, so they wouldn't write anything. Um, they were paid to not say anything bad about him. Um, so essentially this whole community and all of these entities just kind of surrounded Noble and protected him and did everything possible to um, push me out. And you would have thought like even my coworkers, they wouldn't talk to me because they were, scared they were going to be subpoenaed and brought into something. And, oh, my God, God forbid, I have to stand up for the right thing. Um, they they treated me as if, like, I had leprosy, to be honest. And it was still to this day, it was not until my case resolved that people now started to come out and say, oh, well, by the way, I always knew and I had seen bruises and I just didn't know what to say. And, you know, of course, now. Um, but yeah, it was just absolutely devastating. So then the, this, um, so you leave the department and then there's a lawsuit? Yeah. So actually I had been contacted by a firm. I didn't even, I didn't even know, like I didn't want to, I, I never really thought about a law, a lawsuit, but some of the judges and the attorneys that I knew from the DA's office who were encouraging me to fight this had talked to a firm. And the firm actually called and they said, hey, look, we heard about these things that were happening. Have you ever considered suing? And I was like, no. So we ended up flying up, my daughter and I, I think, or I went up there, met with the firm and they um, had kind of broken everything down. They knew what had happened and they said it would be an honor for us to represent you 
um, because what's happened is completely wrong. And, and I was like, okay. The caveat at the time was that the attorneys did not want me to include, they did not want to sue the DA for reasons of, uh, you know, the power that a DA has. I don't know how much people know, but the DA is immune from prosecution or, you know, being sued unless you can prove some kind of criminal intent or it's very, very hard to prove, right? So you're fighting this kind of protected person who's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And he has the discretion to decide when somebody is going to be charged and when not. And him saying that I was inconsistent with my statements, therefore I am a liar, was apparently enough for him to justify not prosecuting the case, um, not doing anything with Noble, I guess he he probably could have pushed the department to get rid of him, right? Because he influenced my department to do what they did. So, um, so yeah, so the lawsuit, basically we named, um, okay, so anyways, going back to the DA, they said he cannot be prosecuted. We want to drop him. And I was very, very adamant. I said, I, I need him included because to not include the DA who was the ring leader of all of these events would be to me just as bad as just like, I don't want to be one of them. I feel like by letting him off of the hook, just because he simply has the power was, um, was wrong. And the principle of everything that I was about to fight for was do the right thing, no matter what it costs you stand up for yourself. Um, and go, the people that have the most power should actually be held accountable when they do things like they did to me. Mm -hmm. So I said, if we don't include the DA, I, I don't want to go forward. And so they included the DA. Um, so the Dave Eister, uh, Noble himself, my department, uh, so Mendocino County Probation, Chief Ganter. So it was the department, Noble, my chief, my former chief, the DA. I think, yeah, I think that's all who was named. And your former chief, he skated because he, he left the department? Yeah. So he, he sent out this like corny flyer saying, I'm going to ride off into the sunset and start enjoying my retirement early. And later I was told that 100% he was forced to go because once the judges and everybody, you know, realized what was happening, um, there was like, you know, the, you know, the conversations that happen behind closed doors, like this was not something that needed to happen. It should have been prevented. They should have never, ever even begun to treat me the way that they did. And it was all on his watch and um, he didn't do anything about it. And there had been years of sexual harassment at one point a year prior or so our entire department was pulled into a conference room and told that the entire department was on an IA for some allegations of sexual, um, I don't know, it was like preferential treatment or something. The department, the state of the department was absolutely terrible and it just continued to get worse. So I think that after all this was done, um, he just needed to go and then they hired her. But then she ended up getting fired less than a year later in her position um, for she was having an affair with uh, her now, I think, husband uh, who was running juvenile hall. So he was the superintendent for juvenile hall and they were using county funds to like go to trainings. And so she got her karma whack. Um, and then ironically enough, after she was fired, she actually reached out to me and coworkers were like, hey, um, Pamela is trying to get a hold of you because she wants your attorney's phone number. And, what? you know, my position was this, was that you had the absolute ability to make things right for me and for my kids, for my, my, the trajectory of my entire life was in her hands mm -hmm. and she screwed me just as bad, you know? Um, so I did not return her phone call. And I told, I said, Hey, if you guys talk to her, let her know that, you know, she was fired for reasons of conduct that she chose. It was intentional. It was decisions she mm -hmm. made. I was a victim of their shitty organization and management. And we are not the same. Like, take your, yeah, take and your stuff somewhere else. She texted I, you 
later on and said, Hey, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, of course my attorney was trying to interview her when we thought we were going to trial and, um, she was very vague with what she was going to be able to give us. But once the case settled, she, um, and it, I think it went out in the newspapers finally, um, she texted me, you know, you saw pages and pages of text messages, just confessing how sorry she was, mm. how much regret she had, um, excuses and, and, but, you know, I appreciate the fact that she did give me the information that she gave me because in the back of my mind, I've always just wanted to know at the end of the day, why did they do this to me? Why did they, did they doubt that this happened to me? Because there has to be a reasonable explanation as to why you would take somebody who I was so, I was so like dedicated to that apartment. Uh, you could ask anybody. It was down there at 3 a.m. if somebody needed me to run, you know, a rap sheet on somebody or I don't know, put a warrant out. I would go down there, you know, and I'm like trying to figure out how how does this happen to me? And she just basically admitted that she was weak and she wasn't willing or able to stand up to the DA. Um, she confirmed that the DA mm. just hated me and that's why he did what he did. She confirmed that there was no um, there was no question that everybody acknowledged and openly was discussing the fact that I was a victim in domestic violence. So she confirmed that for me and confirmed that it, this was done out of hate and um, this was not done because they were professionally, you know, they weren't required or mandated to do this. They did it knowingly and willingly, right? They voluntarily did this to me every single day. And one person could have just pulled the plug and said, you know what? It's gotten out of hand. Let's restore her back. Maybe have her go see a psych, right? Okay, have me go through a psych. I totally understand them not wanting to give me my gun back until they could they could determine that I was emotionally sound, right? Um, but my argument was I had went through all of the abuse and kept it under wraps. I kept it pretty quiet considering um, I showed up every day and put 100% into my job and nobody even knew it was happening for the longest time. I then went through all of these punishment efforts and not one time did I, you know, act out, did I, I mean, the things that I could have done as a result of what they were doing to me was a very broad spectrum of things I think I could have been justified in doing. And instead, I showed up every day. I was professional um, and I did my job. And so I think that speaks a lot to my character and my state of mind and my ability to overcome all of these hurdles. I was deserving of having my gun, not because mm -hmm. they used it as a badge of honor, because that's... That's what that department, the people armed, it's a badge of honor. I deserve to be able to go home to my family safe every night like everybody else did. And um, I, I think that that I would have done anything to prove that I was worthy of being armed again, if that makes sense. And, yeah, so, um, basic, yeah. so basically her texts were, hey, sorry, I, sorry, I'm a crappy person. Yeah, I'm sorry I was weak. I didn't stand up to him. We cheered the day that we found out that Noble was fired. And when she says we, she's referring to her partner she's with who hmm. he still works at the probation department. She gets fired because of their affair. Uh, she was married to a judge at the time and he was married to like a school teacher. So I was like, you know, OK, um, that seemed like a little bit of karma for her. Um, you know, that felt like I was a little vindicated, but I do appreciate the fact that she was honest and offered these things to me. And I understand she was human. She fell victim to the same, um, you know, circumstances that everybody else did. So to give her a little grace, I think she was new. She was a female. She felt very empowered and she was being led by the most corrupt, um, government official that I've ever met in my life. Hmm. You know, what's what's completely stupid about this is that going back to the eighties, we knew back in the 1980s, the psychology of domestic violence victims. Yeah. This is not new. If you had told me, Hey, yeah, nothing's going on. I'd be like, yes. <laughs> thank you. Yes. 
we yes. all would have been like, I, I kind of was doing that to myself, right? Because yeah. we know. Yeah. And yeah. And the DA, this is the thing with the DA is that he hung his hat on and these claims to put me on a Brady list, which he never did do because I went on to be hired by a legitimate, I mean, the state of California, a criminal investigator in Orange County, me coming from this podunk little town who was not deserving of a firearm got hired by, I mean, that was my dream. I mean, to think I came down here and nobody got the job for me. I did it myself because I was worthy and I deserved it because I, mm -hmm. you know, because that's the person that I am and I did deserve it. And um, to think that these people can, you know, can just remain up there and, and do what they do, you would think that I would have never like the county council said, I would never have been able to get a job again. And mm -hmm. um, it just, it absolutely blows my mind. What, um, so you said there was a, a lawsuit. Is that all ended and that's behind you now? What happened with the with the case? Yeah, unfortunately there, there was a lot that I wish I could have done differently. Um, we started out with a firm uh, I guess these cases are pretty complicated because you're you're suing government agencies, right? Mm -hmm. And government officials. So we started out with a firm. They did the initial complaint, but then my attorney ended up being, he ended up separating from the firm and went out on his own. So I had been given the choice to stay with the firm um, or go with him. And so I called a friend of mine who's a judge and I said, hey, what do you think? And she's like, let me make some calls and get back to you. She said, a hundred percent stay with Richard, your attorney, because he is the expert in employment law and that's the way to go. And um, so I made that decision. Unfortunately, he, so he was quite old um, and he was a dynamite attorney and I have no doubt, but he took on this case. I don't think realizing how much for a sole practitioner, it was way too much. Um, and then there was a lot with me being down here. He was in Sonoma County. That case was in Mendocino County. Um, and then COVID hit and COVID kind of ruined everything, right? And in civil court, it, once the petition's filed, I believe you have up to five years to get it to trial or the judge can dismiss it. And that's where those articles for the LA Times came in. Um, because of COVID, they didn't want to give us any grace. Also, the court had... Um, accidentally closed my file, my case on the court portal. And I had to fight like six months to get it back open again. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, well, the case is closed and very, very bizarre. So with all that said, at the end of the day, we got <laughs> close to the five year mark. We needed to go to trial. Um, here he's five years older. All this time has gone by. All of my witnesses now are like recanting or saying, you know, they weren't deposed. They should have been. This should have been a, a million dollars. I think their demand in the beginning was five million. It should have been. It should have been that. But once again, here I am. Um, my attorney just kind of was over it, unfortunately. And so I was reaching out to other firms and said, you know, I just think this is too much for him. And they wouldn't take it. Nobody would take over the case because they said too much time had lapsed, mm -hmm. that we were too far into the case, even though we didn't even do a deposition, not a single deposition. But because of the time frame and then him having done, there was interrogatories and things done. Um, they said that they didn't want to get like start in the middle of it. So I couldn't get anybody to take over the case. So we ended up just basically having to settle because I didn't have any other choice. He didn't want to go to trial. I did. Um, and then we had filed a case for my daughter because I wanted her to feel like she had some say in this and that her name was always going to be written on a piece of paper saying, I tried to fight back against this man. Um, so we all came together for a case conference. And she's like, mom, I can't go through this anymore. She had just gotten married. She wants to, you know, wanted to start a family. I'm over here going like, this is six years. I want to go to trial. I don't care if we lose. You know, I probably wasn't very rational. But at the end of the day, I this had been something I had fought for six years, every single day, something. I did it all. I filed motions, you know, prepared things. This was my heart and my soul. 
And she was like, mom, I can't do this. So, you know, once again, I did what was best for everybody and, and that's fine. Um, the county paid out some money, but I ended up having to take that money and pay back the DA's attorney fees. So knowing that I still chose to fight and there was a two year long federal case that of course I did not win because I had no chance, but that was not the principal. So all the money that I got from the county either went to my attorney or I had to pay the DA's fees. But you know what? I was very happy for that because like I said all along, um, I have never recovered and I will never recover from what happened financially. Uh, I have zero retirement left, nothing, zero to this day. And I have a lot to make up for, but I was happy to, to have that check written and pay the DA's fees because it's principal, because it was the right thing. And even though I had no choice, and I had no chance, and no chance to, to win, that was besides the point. My name will always be up on that federal website saying that at least I tried, and mm -hmm. I did the right thing. And then, so his case settled first, had to pay him out, and then um, they decided that the chief couldn't be sued personally because he was a, an agent for the county. So they dismissed that. So I didn't sue him, I guess, he didn't, he got off scot free. And then the county, yeah, so the county money went there. And then Noble's attorney, um, they threatened to file bankruptcy, or he was in the process of filing bankruptcy. So basically, they offered, um, I don't even remember, but most of that was going to go to the attorney. And um, so I agreed. I don't even know actually how much. Um, they offered some amount. Anyways, I didn't really get anything. And whatever I did get um, went to my daughter so that she could start her family. And, mm -hmm. and that was the end of that. So he, yeah, he, um, yeah, he chickened out. He got to keep the house, everything. Um, yeah, it, it still, even after all of that, it still didn't resolve the way that it should have. Mm hmm and I'm still the one suffering, right? Yeah. So what happened to, uh, to Noble? I mean, there's an ending to his part of this. Yeah. So he was, I don't know at what point he was hired as chief. I remember that day I was just like, oh my God. And my friends were like, Amanda, just let him, the higher he goes up, the higher he's going to fall. But I had no faith that anything would ever come, any karma would come back to him. But I was wrong. So apparently at some point we had went up for the hearing to set the trial date, came back to Southern California. And two days later, I get a call from somebody saying, Hey, they thought Noble was arrested. And I'm like, Oh my God, no way. Come to find out the, there was a search warrant served on his house. They went and took all of the city stuff, you know, his cars, his phone, all of his chief stuff. Um, there had been a female that his, I guess his 35, like he was having, a, I don't know, some relationship with a female potentially. Um, either way, she ended up uh, catching, I think he was caught on ring camera going to her house, full uniform on duty. Something went down inside. She is accusing him of forced oral cop. Um, she, he left, he had like texted her um, like, oh, that was weird or something indicating, I guess that's evidence that they're going to use against him. Um, so allegations came out of forced oral cop in her home while on duty with his gun and everything. So you know what that means? Um, she calls as soon as he leaves and reports it and says that she was forced to perform this oral sex on him. I believe, um, she went down, had a start start exam and then those results confirmed that something happened um so yeah they put him off on leave the city did they were forced to at that point um i think he was off on leave for like two or three days at the most and then he was fired and of course um the victim is being blamed saying that she's crazy that she's had multiple accusations she's made against other men um, and I know this because the investigator has gotten a hold of me and asked if they can use some of my discovery in their case or if I could testify. Um, 
But yeah, so the DA refuses to prosecute. He is now going on, I believe, two years, I think it's been, and there's zero prosecution and the DA refuses to tell anybody why. Um, I guess there was a call to the attorney general in protest as to why is he still continuing to cover up for this man who clearly didn't learn his lesson the first time mm -hmm. and clearly is victimizing people still. And the DA, the attorney general kicked it back and said, you know, your DA is a professional. He should handle his own cases. And so there's no oversight. He's not being prosecuted. So the victim is suing him in federal court. Um, and the status of that case, I'm not sure. Um, I don't believe it's resolved. Um, I think it's still pending, but he is now an insurance agent for a local insurance company in town. So, uh, which is probably the greatest job for him because he, you know, his personality, he can sell ice to Eskimos because that's what he does. So he went from chief of police and making so much money for, you know, for the town, for the position, that was like the best job. He finally made it to the top and he couldn't even hold on to it for a year. It was less than a year and he was fired. And, um, but he's still living there. I'm told he's still, you know, kind of parading around this whole time. He had been married. He married some girl right after me, you know, classic DV kind of got back in there and pulled her in. Uh, some young girl, I guess, had two kids with her. So she stuck with him. Uh, Lord only knows what she's probably going through. Um, and so, yeah, he's an insurance salesperson with a new federal case pending, um, married with two kids, I guess, and living his best life there. And, and I guess there's no shame and no embarrassment because if that were you or I, uh, I certainly wouldn't be anywhere near the proximity of the town that <laughs> any of these things happened. Right. So it, it really does speak volumes as to who he is, like his character. I feel like the fact that he can show his face every day, it's yeah. pretty mind blowing. Do you know how many years he had total with the, all of his pension stuff? I believe 2000, I think he was sworn in Lake County as a, correctional officer in 2006, maybe. Um, I know he had been on a few years when we met. So I think he maybe like 2006, he may have transferred over. So I don't know, 2006 to um, 2020, was it 21, 22 that he got fired? Hmm. And it, still, still didn't have 20 years on, so. But like uh, yeah, a lot more than me. A lot more than me, um, which is zero. So I don't Has know he... if he was able to keep. I don't know how that works when you're fired at that point. If you get to keep your retirement. Yeah, well, if he's if he's fired and, and there's no criminal allegations, you'd have to go to prison and all kinds of stuff for them to actually pull your pension. But he he's not going to get a full pension just simply because he doesn't have, uh, you know, that much time on the on the job. Yeah. So. Yeah. So um, he has a few years. He would have had a few more years to work for sure. Cause you know, I think he would have been maybe he's 45 now. So he only had a few more years to go. Yeah. And, um, so, so yeah. In closing, how are you doing? Um, I'm good. I mean, I think that being able to have this platform to be able to tell my story is really, really helping me. Um, it's been a rough, rough seven years since I left. Um, I think the close of the case was probably the best thing for me, even though I couldn't see it at the time because I was just so focused on getting my story out there, right? When you've been accused by so many people, or, you know, it wasn't even like outward accusations, but the lack of people standing up for me or being willing to speak up and kind of just like seeing me and avoiding me because they thought that I was this walk walking toxic, you know, just um, bag of issues. I feel like they, everybody just deserted me, you know? So I moved down here. It took me a couple of years. Um, I'm not going to lie. You know, I didn't share any of my personal life with anybody. And then I met a group of people that I now work with that are absolutely amazing. And they've like restored my faith a hundred percent because, you know, all that time, all the people that were closest to me and consoling me and 
we're there for me and supposed to be protecting me. We're the ones feeding all of this information back to my chief. And then when the shit hit the fan and it was time to tell what they knew, they were like, oh, I don't remember. I don't know. I'm scared. I'm going to be retaliated against. So my trust, I think, and just kind of my restoration of just humans in general is starting to come back. Um, so my focus is like, what now, you know, because they ruined my, um, my love for the profession. But you know, when you're in this profession for so long, people look at you and you're having to justify on paper, well, you can do this and you can carry a gun and you can hang from a helicopter, but what can you do in this area? And, you know, it's just a weird transition trying to go from that profession to a civilian job. So, you know, my next steps are just figuring out um, school, like what's my next step? Am I going to go to law school, which I would love to do? Uh, but financially, you know, that's that's been the hardest, the hardest hit for me. So, you know, I have to make some decisions. Um, but yeah, but I just appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about this stuff because I think that for me, keeping it in, um, I begin to believe, well, maybe this is just what happens to people. Um, you know what I mean? Like when something happens to you and it's so close to you, you don't actually always understand how bad it actually was. And then when I tell my story, it's very complicated and a lot of people don't want to listen to the whole thing. And I understand why. But it's so important. And people tell me, well, you want to be able to help other people and you can motivate other people or inspire them. I'm like, OK, but help me do that. How do I how do I write a book? Right. How do I do you could put this in a documentary? Everybody says this is just crazy. Right. But how do I do those things? So this is this has been amazing. And I appreciate you having me on to tell the story um, and just that helps me a lot. So I would say I'm good. And hopefully things just continue to get better. Well, that's awesome. You know what? Um, I, I, I just feel like in your future, you, you, you present yourself very well. You're very, you're articulate in how you, how you uh, present what happened to you. I think that's, uh, you're an incredible interview. And Thank I you. really think that you, you will be the Aaron Brockovich of victim advocacy and, uh, you know, people need to be able to talk with someone that has been where they're at. And yeah. um, I think you have a you have a really good path ahead of you for I appreciate um, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I looking back, I think so many times I would say, had I had one person that was didn't have a dog in the fight, right? And they could come to me and say, I'm recognizing what you're going through. You have to wake up and like take care of yourself. Don't worry about what's gonna happen to Noble and his reputation because mm -hmm. I I was worried about mm -hmm. that. I was worried about my livelihood, my ability to survive physically, emotionally, but I was worried about so many people and not myself. And had anybody been able to come to me and be like an advocate and say, do you realize, you know, do you hear yourself? Like you are worthy of standing up for yourself. I would have handled things so much differently, you know? And so hopefully that is something that I can do to help other people. And I think having the media so quiet. So for the most, for the longest time, I was told no media because it's going to ruin your case. But in reality, not having the media's attention or the media not being willing to put out my story was the worst thing ever. So mm -hmm. having been through so many things in so, so many issues within just the span, this case, I mean, there's so many just different issues that developed. I'm hopeful that I can help somebody with whatever little part they may be going through. Um, you know, and then it helps me feel like everything I went through was not for nothing, right? There, there's a purpose. So, um, yeah, I just really appreciate being able to tell the story, and I, I it means the world to me. Well, th thank you so much for you. You are the catalyst for this section of of uh, our YouTube. 
<clears throat> and uh, you're the reason why we're going to be doing more stories like this. And uh, I just want to say thank you for being here and being the inaugural uh, episode for this for this section. And God bless you. And I just pray that you, you know, uh, there. I, I really think that there's things that are going to come your way that you have no idea that uh, how this is going to help others and that it's going to it's going to um, do those things that you had hoped the news media had done. And we're going to just get yeah. a grassroots effort effort uh, to get the word out there about how this this happened. But um, again, thank you so much. And yes, thank you. And uh, we will, I, I want to be a part of this journey with you and keep up Thank with you. all this stuff with you. So, I will. I'll keep uh, you yeah. posted. Thank Absolutely. you again. Absolutely. And thank you everybody for listening.